welcome everyone. Um, this local food college uh, is a webinar that's been hosted by the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Uh, this is our eighth year and I'm proud to say I believe this is the third one I've hosted and I really enjoy them and I really enjoy the questions and information we were able to share uh, on these sessions. So the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships are we're an extension based organization and our goal is to connect greater Minnesota communities to the University of Minnesota to support local sustainability projects. RSDP brings together community and university knowledge and resources to drive sustainability in four focus areas, agriculture and food, food systems, clean energy, natural resources, and resilient communities. Uh, and uh, Jason will take it away. So just a little introduction here about Jason. Jason has worked for the U of UW Extension as an agriculture agent for Ashland and Bayfield County since 2007. His primary extension work involves commercial horticulture, business development, nutrient management, and new crop development. He co-leads the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative and is currently working primarily on the Hazelnut Project. He and his wife, Melissa, live near Ashland, Wisconsin and operate Wild Hollow Farm, producing vegetables, currants, and cut flowers. And with that, we will hand it over to Jason. Good evening, everyone. Just getting the slides going here. I'm originally from Minnesota. I grew up in uh, Shorewood, which is a suburb, I guess, of the Twin Cities area. Did my undergraduate work at Carleton College and did my graduate work uh, at the St. Paul campus. So I know Minnesota pretty well. I've been all over the state over the years. These days I live in Ashland, Wisconsin, right in the center of hazelnut country. So that's what I was asked to talk about and we're going to jump right into it. Um, so first off, who's this presentation for? Well, it's pitched to a you know, broad scale of growers from gardeners that are interested in just a few plants around the house um, to hobby growers for subsistence or you know, really just to grow them for fun. And, and actually that's where most of our growers are at these days, that scale. Um, we're also, as we scale up here, as, as we go through this presentation, you'll, you'll learn more about what I mean by that. But we're looking for participatory plant breeders, folks that are growing plants for nuts, for sure, for eating or for sale, but also to grow data, as we like to say, uh, in terms of helping us find even better plant material. Um, I'll talk about at the end, we are in the process of launching grower networks. So for those of you that have an interest in doing this commercially, you know, we envisioned growers at a small scale, somewhere less than five acres that are working with others to pool their resources, pool their, their nuts to get them to market. But we're also uh, looking for what I call the let's go crowd. Those that are ready to do this big time, do this as a commercial f uh, enterprise as part of their farm business. Um, so that's kind of who it's pitched to um, on the presentation and we'll see in your questions or in the chat box, you know, where you fall in the spectrum. But um, so tonight I wanna to talk about hazelnuts, the global crop, the global industry. I think it's important to understand the context for why we're trying to do hazelnuts here in the upper Midwest. I'll talk then more specifically about what's going on um, because lots of things are happening right now in hazelnuts. Uh, and at any time, if you, you know, want more information, if you like what you hear, all of this information and uh, we've got past conference presentations, we've got lots of publications. There's a Hazelnut 101 fact, fact sheet series that's available. All that's at our web, website at midwesthazelnuts.org. Uh, we also host an annual conference. This year it's March 6 and 7 coming right up and it'll be in Decorah, Iowa. Uh, and registration information for that conference is now online at our website. So the Upper Midwest Hazelnut Development Initiative, this was a project that was launched in 2007 by a collaboration of the University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, and has since grown since then to include uh, <clears throat> non-government organizations, so nonprofit groups like the uh, Rural Advantage in Southern Minnesota or the Savannah Institute, which covers uh, a bunch of different states or even the Iowa Nut Growers Association. Um, <clears throat> we've been able to piece together our research program over the years, but just recently we were awarded $5 million from the USDA, which with matching funding 
from the Grantham Foundation that's going to significantly enhance the kind of work that we can do. And just in time because we've got new plant material to get out to growers, so there's a lot, a lot going on. So a little bit about the global context of, of the hazelnuts. Um, generally, if you're talking about hazelnut production, you're talking about Turkey uh, and Italy and really the Mediterranean states. And that's because the plants, hazelnut plants, they're called European hazelnuts. That particular species is not particularly cold hardy. So it needs those warm winters to survive, <clears throat> which is why production is primarily in those, those uh, countries. Give you some perspective, there's about 1.5 million acres in Turkey and accounts for somewhere between 70 and 80 production of US or of global production. Uh, US is on the map, barely, or on the chart, and we're actually seeing, as you'll see in a bit, uh, kind of an explosion of production, but it's still limited to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. And our goal is to try to get it outside that valley and get it into the upper Midwest. Not surprisingly, where uh, hazelnuts are grown is where they're eaten. So Italy, Turkey, Germany uh, account for most of uh, global hazelnut consumption. And again, the U.S. registers on the chart, but not as much consumption. We are an almond eating and a walnut eating country, not a hazelnut eating country. And we see that in our per capita consumption. Uh, if you see the U.S. circled in the red there, uh, the U.S. Uh, citizens tend to eat about half a pound or last point, a quarter pound of hazelnuts per year, which is, you know, next to nothing compared to Italy and Turkey where they're eating three to five pounds a year. So this is both a challenge because most Americans don't even know what hazelnuts are or nor have they eaten them, uh, but it's also a huge opportunity because there's this concept called almond fatigue where people just eat almonds and they're looking for something different. And when they finally get a chance to, dis to eat fresh, say fresh roasted hazelnuts, they're converted and they're looking for more. And so we're starting to see more and more products on the marketplace uh, with hazelnuts in them, led by Nutella. Uh, about 40% of the world's hazelnut production goes to make one product. And that's that chocolate hazelnut spread that people love so much. And the, um, it sounds like there's a participant here from Ontario close to the new facility in, uh, near Toronto. And Ferrero came in and is trying to, to get the same kind of market penetration in the U.S. and in North America that they have in Europe and to make it a household product on, you know, on the scale of peanut butter. So they're kind of blazing the trail in terms of introducing Americans to hazelnuts and following behind our other big production companies um, Mars has this hazelnut Snickers bar. There's more hazelnuts showing up in trail mixes and that kind of thing. And General Mills there in Minnesota is continuing to use more and more hazelnuts. And I think once supply gets sufficient, uh, we'll see even more in cereals and that kind of thing. So as you put this together and you look at uh, global production projections uh, over the next 10 years at current rates, essentially the world needs twice as much much hazelnuts as it has now. Uh, and so the question is where are all these hazelnuts going to come from to meet demand? And probably not Turkey. Turkish production is on the decline. Um, mom and dad are still running the farm but the kids have long since gone and the farms are all pretty small and there's real questions politically and, and uh, just economically whether Turkey can, can keep up. So the world is looking for new production regions and that creates a great opportunity for us here in the Midwest. But first, let's talk about Oregon hazelnut production because that's where the current production is. It accounts for 99% of U.S. production. Uh, to give you some sense of the growth right now, there's 70,000 acres total, but 40,000 of that is new since 2015. There's just a huge planting boom happening. And that sounds like a lot, but in context, California almonds are grown on 1.3 million acres. So our U.S. hazelnut production is is nothing really compared to the scale that nut production could be in our country as witnessed by almonds around 1.3 million acres. Uh, again, it's grown almost exclusively in the US. There's some in, in Washington state, but it's almost exclusively in the Willamette Valley of Oregon running from Portland south to Eugene. And it's just this perfect horticultural region. It's pretty dry and warm during the summer, uh, moderate winters, great soil conditions, and uh, you know, zone 8A which we don't have up here. 
And because of that, you see all kinds of competition for land uh, to grow hops, small fruits. And if anyone's been out there, the scale of agriculture is just really astounding for all these crops. Um, you also have a lot of people that want to live there. And so you've got development pressure as well. And so you see land prices, 15 to $20,000 per acre. So if we're thinking about a competitive advantage for our region, where our land is a lot less cheaper, particularly in the, particular in the northern parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, we may have a, a competitive advantage. This is what a mature orchard looks like in Oregon. Um, people get married under there, you know, it's so pretty uh, and it's great to walk through there. This is not how we're gonna grow hazelnuts in the upper Midwest for a couple of reasons. One, the tree form hazelnuts just don't survive the winters in our region. But two, notice the orchard floor, it's bare. There's nothing growing on it. And that creates real challenges for water quality, soil erosion, that kind of thing. Um, but this is, you know, in Oregon, it historically was just what they refer to out there as the back 40 crop, where they would grow it in good years, they'd harvest uh, these big jumbo in shell nuts, the kind of hazelnuts that you might buy at the grocery store, the two weeks before Christmas, most of them were exported to China, and it really wasn't that thriving of an industry, but it was there. Um, and it almost was decimated by Eastern filbert blight, which is a fungal disease native to our region, actually. Hazelnuts in North America um, are endemic to Northern Great Lakes states, and they evolved with this fungal disease, which our material is resistant to, but the uh, European hazelnuts are lethally susceptible to it. Well, eventually Eastern filbert blight got across the Rocky Mountains, got it went into the Willamette Valley, and this is what the orchards look like. But that led to a concerted effort to develop resistant material and they were successful and that's what's fueling in part uh, because of this new plant material in part because the growing demand for hazelnuts we see all kinds of new plantings that look like this and you'll notice the orchard floor not something we want to do but they do this because the nuts fall out of the tree and they sweep them up off the ground so in order to do that they need a flat surface they need a smooth surface and they need uh, really nothing growing there in order to sweep it up now this picture is a little bit blurry because for one, there lot, there's lots of dust in the atmosphere there when we took this picture a couple years ago because they flail, basically they till the orchard floor to get rid of any vegetation and smooth it out so they create big dust clouds. But you can see uh, hazelnuts as far as the eye can see off into the horizon. It's just how much more is being planted right now. As you might expect, um, you know, there's just so much interest. They'll regularly attract 800 some people to their field days. They have parking attendance at their field days. They get so many people. Uh, there's just so much interest right now. And in response to all the production, they are building the processing facilities to match. This is a new $30 million facility um, for the, the Oregon Hazelnut Growers Cooperative. And, you know, this is what we want to do in the upper midwest we want to see hazelnuts grown on thousands and thousands of acres to support rural economic development provide a, a perennial woody crop that can help with soil and water quality issues and provide jobs for uh, growers and uh, processors we're a long way from this but uh, that's our goal okay so let me shift gears here that gives you some context of the hazelnut industry and what's happening elsewhere um, I'm going to shift gears to hazelnuts up in the Midwest and specifically what we're going to grow and how we might grow it. So there's American hazelnut, which you can buy right now from the DNR for less than a dollar a plant. Uh, if you live in the northern part of the Minnesota, you'll see American hazelnuts wild everywhere. And you can pick them, you can harvest them, but they tend to be really small. The, the shells are thick and it's almost not worth cracking them out. They're so small, but they can be really productive. There's European hazelnut that I'll talk about more in a second. Right now, all of the varieties are not worth planting. They're just not disease resistant enough. They're not winter hardy enough, but that might be changing actually. Uh, so really what we're talking about for the upper Midwest are hybrid hazelnuts. These are crosses between American hazelnut and European hazelnut. And the idea is that they've got the winter hardiness and disease resistance from American hazelnut, but they've got the nut size and productivity from the European uh, hazelnut. Uh, this is what a European hazelnut looks like when it's young, right? It looks like a tree form. But if you note at the bottom of the uh, plant, there's all kinds of suckers. And they'll actually spray these trees three to four times a year to kill those suckers to maintain that tree form. Because even a European hazelnut on its own is going to grow as a multi-stem shrub 
uh, kind of like our American hazelnut. They'll get taller, but they still tr are wanting to be shrubs. There are all these great varieties, <clears throat> and you can see these gorgeous kernels. Unfortunately, we can't grow any of these. So you can drool over the slide, but that's about all we can do with it. Um, there has been work out in New Jersey, however, to find Corliss avalana or European hazelnut that is winter hardy and is disease resistant. They use plant material from Northern Europe because Corliss avalana's range is beyond the Mediterranean. So the hope was they could find plant material from Russia or elsewhere that would work for our region. <clears throat> and Rutgers has now officially released four new varieties and I'll talk about those in a second where you might be able to find them. They are being cautious. They're saying zone six and seven, trialing zone five. So there is some potential perhaps, but I would not bet the farm on these. You know, if you can get some, plant a few, try them out, see how they survive our winters. Uh, but with uh, climate change and, you know, some areas in protected winter environments, they might be a possibility. So uh, stay tuned. <clears throat> All right, so here's what, you know, you, if you live in northern Wisconsin or Minnesota, this is what you might see in some of the national forest ground. Uh, this was just in um, outside uh, Ino in Bayfield County, and it's the Mukwa Barrens, and it's burned regularly by the Forest Service, but it's pretty much American hazelnut as far as the eye can see. And in that, those populations, you'll see plants that look like this, fully loaded with nuts, the branches dragging on the ground by the fall, and you know, lots of great uh, nut production. But the kernels are really small, uh, but they are tasty, and I can't tell you how long it took me to make this slide to crack out all those tiny little American hazelnuts. But the flavor is really kind of amazing. And actually, if you look at the oil content, uh, oleic acid, that's what makes uh, olive oil so healthy. Olive oil is about 75% oleic acid. It's a monounsaturated fatty acid. Well, if you look at American hazelnut, it's close to 80, 81% oleic acid, which is why we call it the northern olive oil. And really one of our marketing goals is to convince foodies, local foodies that, that you know, they usually have three exceptions to their local food diet, uh, coffee, chocolate, and olive oil. And so maybe we can replace olive oil and turn it into um, you know, something, something bigger for our region and, and convert people to uh, hazelnut oil, because it might actually be healthier. We have uh, assembled a breeding population. So we've gone through uh, wild populations across the region and, and save seed from the best plants that we could find. And we're growing those out in Hayward now. So our hope is, you know, not, it's, this won't happen in the short term, we're talking 10, 15 years out, is that we'll have pure American hazelnut uh, varieties that people can grow, that uh, people that feel strongly about using these instead of hybrids. And we're trying to kind of keep both crowds happy. So this is in the pipeline, but it's gonna be a, a ways until we have proven material for you that's, you know, pure American hazelnut. Um, so, like I said, we're looking right now and developing these hybrids, and here's a picture of one in Spooner, Wisconsin. The same kind of American hazelnut growth form, and, but lots and lots of nuts, and the nuts are a lot bigger. And that's, that's the big advantage. So we're able to use the European genetics to increase the nut size. We envision them being grown in hedgerows instead of tree-formed orchards, and they'll be harvested over the top. You know, you can certainly do this by hand. Most people can hand harvest, you know, if they've got friends and family they can call on, you know, one to three acres by hand. It's really slow. And if you're trying to make money, it's probably not feasible. But as a hobby, it's certainly doable. But at scale, if we're talking about thousands of acres, we're looking at machine harvesting. And it turns out these old blueberry pickers actually work pretty well. So I'll show a video of it uh, in action. Uh, the video might be a little bit jumpy, but you'll get the idea here. So these are machines that uh, work with, um, were de developed originally for blueberries and they work really well on the, the advantage of these 
uh, shrubs is that they're real flexible. So you can, you can beat on them pretty hard and to knock the nuts off and the plants come through just fine. The uh, machines, you know, they need some tweaking because they were developed for blueberries, but in terms of trying to move the hazelnuts in and out of the machine. But the exciting thing is that they work great. The other thing you'll notice, you know, or the advantage here is we can harvest directly from the shrub. We don't have to let these fall out of the shrub, which means we can grow whatever on the orchard floor. It can be grasses, forage crops, hay, small grains, vegetables, fruits, whatever, you know, strawberries, whatever you want, uh, as long as you can get that harvester through. So that's kind of, you know, the hybrid is, is what we're after. I do want to make note that most of these hybrids came from on-farm research plantings that early adopter growers, they bought seedlings and, and by seedling, I mean a plant that grew from a seed. So because of that, all these plants, all these blue dots are plantings of seedlings. So every plant on those plantings are, are different, right? So that makes it hard to grow them commercially, but from a plant breeder standpoint, it's like a dream come true. They deployed all this diversity that we've been able to select from to get the, the best plants. And they look something like this. You'll see some plants that look kind of European-like and others that look very much like they came right out of the woods uh, of Northern Minnesota. Um, the problem has been these plantings is that the average yields are just not high enough to make money as a standalone crop. They can work in some circumstances if you're mixing them with, you know, uh, chickens. There's some efforts to do that in the Northfield area. Uh, or you mix them with hay crops in between or something. But generally, as a standalone crop, they're just too diverse. So what we did is we took the best plants from all these plantings <clears throat> and we put them in replicated trials across five locations. In Minnesota, they were at St. Paul, Lake City, and Lamberton. And we evaluated them for about a decade. So we had about 130 some different collections that we evaluated in replicate. And I'll show a video here. This is a flyover. Uh, and there's really no reason I'm showing this video except that it's cool drone footage. So you can see that uh, what the planting in Bayfield looks like. And if you look closely, you'll see all these plants, you know, kind of look different, different colors, different shapes, different heights, just shows the diversity that we were selecting from. And the diversity is important um, going forward. So we're not just selecting one or two. Our goal is to move at least a dozen selections out so growers can have some diversity in their planting, uh, but not too much so that they can still make money doing it. So you get the idea from that, that video, what they kind of look like. So we were looking for plants like this, uh, that they bear good sized nuts and lots of them and early in their production. We don't want to wait seven, eight years for these to, to start producing. We want them to produce in year three or year four. So this one came from a planting near uh, Lake City, Minnesota. And it's gonna be one of the first that will be available to growers. We call it Eric 421 for now, but eventually it'll have a, a real name, we think. And here they are. Uh, these are the top 10 of our 12. And you can see the nut size varies a bit, but they're all nice and round. Uh, they blanch well, and the shells are relatively thin, so they're easy to crack. Um, so our job now is to get them propagated and get them to growers. I just want to show a little bit of data here. This is a slide that shows the distribution of this. So if you went out and harvested a thousand pounds of nuts, this shows what percentage would be 13 millimeters versus 14 versus 15. So the black dotted line is the average of actually 5,000 pounds that we processed this year here in Ashland. And on average, the, the nuts coming off these seedling plantings are about 13 millimeters in size. That's pretty small. In comparison, this yellow line is a, an American hazelnut plant that we cloned, uh, made copies of. And you can see that the average of the uh, seedling hazelnuts, the hybrids, isn't all that different from American hazelnut. But you see this next slide, within that seedling population though, there are a lot of really nice plants and we were able to find those. And so like the red is this Rose 9-2 or the orange is Eric 421. And you can see how we've shifted that size distribution. So most of those nuts are say 14 and 15 millimeters in size, which makes it a lot easier to crack, separate the kernel and the shell and um, easier you know, to, to eat too. So we now have, uh, are starting to deploy these to make them available to growers. And our first step was to establish what we're calling joint performance trials. So this is an opportunity so for growers to go out, see these plants and, and you know, kick the tires, so to speak, and see how, how, they, uh, how they look. 
Um, in Minnesota, they're in Staples and St. Paul. Uh, and their goal is to continue to establish more of these as the plant material becomes available to get them closer to, to growers. Here's one at West Madison. They're still young, uh, but we've got, uh, by now, I think we've got about 25 different selections there. And these are selections not just from our breeding program, which are the ones shown in red, but there are four now from, or sorry, three from the uh, Nebraska uh, breeding program. We've got five or six from Ontario from uh, the Grimmo Nut Nursery, and we'll be including the four from Rutgers as well. So, you know, five years ago, we didn't have any options like this, but now we do for growers. Question is now, how do you get them, right? So they're not all immediately available. They're in propagation, they're in nurseries being grown out for you. The best way to find out is to go to our website, midwesthazelnuts.org, and there's a page called Hazelnut Nurseries. And there's a couple things. There's a, a um, publication that's called Hazelnuts 101 Choosing Plants that will walk you through uh, what's available. It'll talk, it'll give you some information about should I grow seedlings or should I grow these clonal plants, these cultivars. And then there's a list of nurseries that are supplying. For the most part, these nurseries are supplying seedlings for now. Uh, but there are others that are now starting, you know, Grimo Nut Nursery, for example, does sell some of their clonal material. So go to that website and, and go from there. So, you know, back to these seedlings, because you can buy these right now, you can get them for pretty cheap. But as I said, the average performance really isn't good enough. So, but go for it, right? We still want people to plant these. We want them to gain some experience growing hazelnuts, but just be strategic. So don't think of it so much as a money-making adventure. Think of it more as a conservation tool, a hobby, wildlife planting. Um, we do want you to plant these though as well to create a pollen cloud. So if you're gonna do this at a commercial level, what we're recommending now is you plant some of these seedlings, say border rows of your planting, so that you've got a real diverse pollen cloud. You've got, you know, another way to look at it, you've got a, a hundred dads out there uh, to provide pollen. And then as these uh, cultivars become available, m put those in as your main planting, and then you'll have a pollen cloud ready to pollinate all those. Um, and the more pollen you've got around, the, the better production that you typically get. We also, for those of you that are inclined to collect data and keep track of stuff, and um, you know, you're welcome to work with us to get some of these experimental varieties and, and uh, help us collect data on them. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk growing hazelnuts. We do have Hazelnut 101 facts sheets that talks in a lot more detail about how to grow hazelnuts, but I'll give you kind of an overview here to show you that it's not all that challenging to do this. Um, so establishment, this really is the key to hazelnuts. Once you get these established, it is really hard to kill them. Um, and they're pretty easy to grow, but they don't grow very fast year one, year two. They're growing a root system and they uh, kind of just sit there. So it's important to do good weed control. The picture on the left is actually from my farm. Uh, that little guy there now is, now 14 years old, but the, and I guarantee you the plants are at least a little bit bigger than that now. Uh, but we, uh, we had what's called the February blight. We got all excited about hazelnuts and we bought plants in January and they are February. And then they arrived in the spring and we weren't ready. So we planted them into a quack grass and downy brome field. And it was kind of a disaster the first few years. They just sat there and sat there and sat there. So eventually they got out of this grass, but you don't want to plant them into rhizomatous weeds. So anything like quackgrass or brome or thistles, things that are going to just continue to creep in and choke out your plants. So what we prefer is that you have the picture on the right where you've got good weed control in the rows. And then between the rows, you've got whatever you want. In this case, we just have mowed grass, but you could grow vegetables, you could grow a hay crop, depending on your row spacing, you do whatever you want. Just want you to have no weeds in the rows for the first couple of years. <clears throat> now, how you do that is kind of up to you, and it totally depends on, are you willing to use chemicals? Um, what kind of weeds do you have? Are they primarily perennial weeds? Are they herbaceous weeds or grass weeds? Uh, and, and, you know, what kind of tools that you've got for tillage? You could do this by hand or you could get, you know, a weed badger, for example. And at this point, we're kind of recommending you work with your local extension agent. And eventually as we get our grower networks, you'll be able to work with other growers and figure out a weed control plan that works for you. 
Um, planting density wise, we have for the most part been recommending a six foot in row spacing. So six feet between plants and a 15 foot uh, between row spacing. That works well for are the southern parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin where the plants, it's a longer growing season, the plants get bigger faster. Um, but in the northern parts, uh, say in our region, you know, Spooner North, and I suppose, you know, in the Brainerd region, we would recommend a five by 12 because the plants don't get quite as big and you really want to fill that hedgerow as fast as you can. So it gives you some idea of the planting density. Um, planting density is also going to depend on what variety you grow. This Cuddy 228, tends to stay fairly compact. So you would plant more of this to fill in that hedgerow versus Stape N76, which was actually selected from a planting in Staples, uh, tends to sucker. And so it's gonna fill in the hedgerow on its own, kind of like raspberries would do. Um, again, here's another you know, picture of some good weed control. This is in Rosemont, Minnesota, research planting. And um, you can kind of see what, what you expect to see in the first couple of years. If you don't want to use chemicals, right, like they were in that picture, uh, here's a grower that uses landscape fabric with wood chips, a good way to, to keep the weeds down during the planting year. Um, or the kind of approach is just mowing. And here's a, a grower that, that actually was pretty successful because the soils were so fertile. If you're gonna rely on mowing or even spraying, we highly recommend you use a tree tube. If for nothing else, you can find the plants and the weeds and you don't mow them over with your mower. But it also protects from some rabbit or bivory, some deer browse, uh, and if you're using a weed whip, it protects, protects the plants from you. So, you, you know, doing some mowing, you can then take the grass clippings and blow them into the row to use as mulch, that works well. So with those tree tubes on there, it just gives you some more opportunities or more options. So once you've got established plants and they're starting to get pretty big, there's some you know, questions. What do you do long-term in the row? We just say mow it or grow it, just don't till it or kill it. We just wanna make sure there's something uh, green and growing between the rows. In Oregon, it's not as bad as I showed in prior slides. Some growers are using um, cover crops or in this case, they're actually growing seeds. This is mammoth red clover. Um, or they'll do grass seed as well. So again, you've just got lots of options. As the plants get bigger, these are still some questions that we've got is when do we start pruning? When do we just mow these down and let them cop us back? Uh, the hope is that through our research plantings or the intention is that we'll have answers for you by the time you have to deal with this. But generally just keep in mind these plants on rich sites will get pretty big as you can see in this picture. And so we're gonna have to do some size management. Okay, so most people who uh, you know talk to me about hazelnuts will say, "Oh yeah, my grandpa used to pick hazelnuts," or we have a few hazelnut plants, but the, they all disappear. And it's true. Once those hazelnuts are ripe, every varmint in the county comes calling. Uh, blue jays and rodents are probably the worst. Uh, blue jays I will not see on my farm all year, and then all of a sudden, in a day in late August, I've got 30 blue jays in my hazelnuts just going to town. And that tells me when the hazelnuts are ripe. So then the game is on, how fast can I pick compared to the blue jays? So it really is true. You just have to pay attention to your plantings and keep track of when they start to ripen so that you can pick them before the critters do. The good news is the deer, for the most part, will leave hazelnuts alone. They will browse them. You know, there's no such thing as a deer proof plant, but they don't graze them to the ground like they will some other shrubs. Uh, they'll do browsing on them a little bit. They don't go after the nuts. They, tend to just eat the buds in the spring. If you do have, you know, a particularly aggressive deer, you may have to use some deer repellent spray like plant skid or actually in some cases fence out the deer entirely. But generally the concern are the blue jays and rodents. And really it's kind of like blueberries, right? If you plant one blueberry in your garden, uh, you're gonna have a hard time picking blueberries because the critters come after them. So hazelnuts are kind of like that. You're gonna have to plant enough to accommodate some losses because it's just inevitable. The other challenge of seedlings is because those plants ripen at different times in the planting, um, the critters are there all the time because they're just following the right plant. So you have to be out there keeping track of when things are ripe and ripening before they get to them. Versus say a, a clonal planting where you've got a row of one variety. Well, they're all ripe the same day for the most part. So you can go in there and pick them all and they just can't eat them that fast. 
but be aware it's an issue. All right, so harvesting, dehusking. You know, again, this is Oregon where they're getting the ground ready for the nuts to drop out of the tree. Luckily, we are not gonna be doing this. Um, the reason we can't do that, even if we wanted to, is that we actually get rain in the fall. And if the plant, if the nuts hit the ground and it's wet and muddy, you're gonna lose the crop to mold, you're gonna lose the crop for food safety reasons. So it's just not an option for us. That's why we're using these, uh, what's called a slapper type harvester or straddle harvesters that go over the row. These will cost new 70, 80,000, which is why we're trying to cluster growers so that they can share these. But right now the uh, growers are picking these up used for you know around 10 to 15,000. So they're somewhat affordable, especially if you're sharing them uh, with, with neighbors. Again, another video here that shows the, um, the action of the slapper types. Video seems a little jumpy, but so you can see they're just kind of being hit by these rotating bars to knock the nuts off. Pretty straightforward. Another option that we've tested is called a rotary shaker harvester. And these uh, don't actually spin around, they just, they're, uh, circles of these of these teeth that just kind of vibrate back and forth. So I'll show a video of that that action as well. So those aren't actually spinning, they're just rotating or um, vibrating. So it does a good job taking the nuts off and it causes almost no damage to the plant. Again, if you know, you're a hobby grower or a homeowner and you're not ever gonna be this scale, you can certainly hand pick. It just takes a while. Uh, next year, we're gonna test Big Blue. This is a, an olive harvester uh, that will be able to handle taller and bigger plants. We've got some repair work, as you can see, to get, get it up and running, but that'll be next year. All right, so now we are picking them in the husk. So you've gotta, right now, uh, dry them. And usually people just put them in onion bags and leave them outside or hanging under a, in the garage or something. Or if you have a greenhouse, you can spread them out on greenhouse benches. And then they run them through a barrel husker, which is pretty straightforward. You just dump the nuts in there and there are some paddles in there that bang around and knock the husk off the, the, hut, the nuts. Um, as you get a little larger scale, this is in the lower uh, corner is a, a Turkish husker because Turkish hazelnuts are all picked in the husk as well. So they have the same dehusking uh, step that they have to do that we do. And those huskers actually work pretty well, um, but nobody's manufacturing states so that we still have to import them from Turkey. There's work some to make some customized harvesters to make them locally. And this Pendragon X12 is something that's available that works pretty well as, uh, for growers. So the husking technology is there. You got to spend a little money for it. Um, you know, we do all of our stuff, you know, we, we plant, harvested about 1200 plants for our research trials this year. And we ran them all through this barrel husker that we built for about 500 bucks. So it's definitely doable to do this on a small do it yourself scale. Okay, so post harvest processing, this is a challenge, right? You've got in shell hazelnuts. Now you got to get them out of the shell and you've got to separate those shell fragments from the kernel. Uh, you can do it by hand. You can sit by the fire all winter and do it, but, um, you know, if you're trying to sell and make money doing this, you, we got to do this mechanically. So we're trying to make this easier for growers. We have established this hazelnut processing accelerator. It's a public private partnership that is building a pilot facility. Uh, so the idea is that while we're still in this kind of scale up phase is we'll do all the research and testing for growers so that once you've, you know, we've got an industry and there's a need for more processing capacity is we'll basically have a turnkey operation that folks can just copy. Um, so we're currently doing the processing in Ashland. Like I said before, this last year we had about 5,000 pounds uh, so far run through it. We still have probably another 1,000 pounds to go. And this shows some of the equipment that we're using. Uh, it's smaller scale to kind of match the scale that we're at. And it's most of it's on wheels so we can move it in and out of buildings. Um, and right now this is, you know, it's working. It's still a little bit too slow. So we've ordered some better equipment. Um, but eventually uh, it'll be available so folks can copy it. And in the short term, it's open to folks to use. You just have to call me to schedule a time and you can use this equipment. I'll show a video here of kind of it in action. Uh, it starts out with cracking, goes across an aspirator to pull off some of the shell fragments. And then it goes through a roller sizer or a drum sizer to separate out the shell from the uh, kernel.
So that that production equipment is not not very large, but it's still not cheap either. So you know each of those pieces of equipment costs somewhere you know ten thousand dollars. So on a small scale, you know, it's not really feasible. But again, the idea is that we've got growers working together that can then share that equipment. As production grows, we also will need to grow uh, processing capacity. And here is a smaller grower in Oregon. And you can just see some you know, different equipment that's being used. So eventually we'll be, we'll be running this kind of stuff. So let me talk a little bit about economics. Again, for gardeners, you know, this doesn't really matter, but if you're trying to do this as a business, I just wanna point out a couple of things. First is we do have a spreadsheet tool on our website that is designed uh, to help you come up with your own enterprise budget. So you can go through each of these steps and enter in your numbers, you know, how much it costs you to work up an acre, how much it costs you to plant, how much it costs you to put wood chips down and come up with your own numbers. We do, we have published economic models that give us sort of, give you our best guess about what all this will cost and what the revenue could be. But the idea is that you need to build it for yourself, these models. Uh, so it provides this tool for you. Um, the net income is shown here. This is the annual net income before interest and in taxes or principal. So before you've paid your borrowing costs. The uh, gray bars are actual numbers from Oregon and the orange bars are projected numbers based on our research that we've done and our, the produ productivity of the plants. And you can see we closely match Oregon production. And you'll see uh, once you're up to scale and once you're at full production, your net income is somewhere between two and $4,000 a year with really very little input costs. The challenge though is see this orange bar is just like any woody crop, like blueberries or apples, you're gonna spend a fair amount of money to get stuff established before you start getting positive cash flow. And that means a break even point somewhere close to year nine. Uh, and this is the reverse J curve that all woody crop growers dread, right? You've got to make an investment in the first few years to get things established. But then once you've turned the corner, um, the advantage of these woody crops is you get low input, uh, high value, uh, you know, net income for years to come. So that's the exciting part. So market development, I'll just end here with a few slides. Um, so like I said before, we've got this big growing demand for hazelnuts, but that's great to see numbers on a chart. How does that convert into you being able to sell hazelnuts, right? And furthermore, how do we convince Americans that aren't used to eating hazelnuts to eat hazelnuts? It sounds good that there's an opportunity, but we actually have to convince them to eat them. Well, we've got a company here in the Midwest that's blazing a trail for all of you. Um, it's called the American Hazelnut Company. It was formed in 2014. I believe they have 20 members now, all grower members. And they are taking Midwest hazelnuts and turning them into oil and flour. What they have found so far is that they have no problem selling hazelnut kernels. The Midwest grown stuff tastes, it, it just tastes amazing, especially when they're fresh and they're roasted. Uh, the problem is they just don't have enough hazelnuts. Plus the cost to process them is still a little bit too high. So the price point is, <clears throat> is a little bit too high, but even then they can sell all they can grow. So we need more production. Uh, what we found though, is that um, the oil and the flour is a little bit harder to sell. And I'll show you a picture here. So here is hazelnut oil on the shelf here in Ashland with walnut oil, peanut oil, sunflower oil, uh, pumpkin seed oil, almond oil, flax oil, you name it. It's on the specialty oil aisle. And these are oils that people buy once a year, maybe, and they use them as a condiment. And typically they go rancid in the shelf because they don't use them fast enough. So stores are eager to buy from the producers and love, and it's really no problem to get it on the shelf. The problem is getting it off the shelf because American consumers just are not used to eating olive oil. So as a industry, we have to figure out how to turn it into the Northern olive oil, if you will, and get it on the olive oil shelf where people are buying it far more regularly. Flour is um, a similar scenario where people, you know, the gluten-free crowd loves it, but again, consumers aren't used to eating it. So we've got to get it to consumers, expose them to it, and typically once they try it, they do, they do like it. Okay, so um, what, what are the next steps here in the Midwest? How do we get this plant material to you? How, do you? how do you as a potential grower get involved? 
Well, if you're just kind of a hobby grower, you're just looking for some plants for the garden, you know, go to our website and you can find where to buy plants. For those of you thinking about doing this as a business, uh, we encourage you to start getting involved with the industry. So that means going to field days, conferences, and consider joining one of these grower networks. We are trying to establish these across the upper Midwest. We're starting with seven initial grower clusters. And the idea is to kind of make a learner community so folks can get together, work together. They can go in and buying plants to get, you know, bulk discounts. They can, uh, the, the goal is to have germplasm trials or performance trials in each of these clusters so that there's locally relevant information for them. And then eventually as they has pr have production, they can work together on harvesting and post-harvest processing and marketing. So that's our goal. Um, in, in Minnesota, there are two that are just getting started and the kickoff meetings are scheduled. Uh, the first one is February 24 in Rochester. I don't know exactly where that is yet as being hosted by Rural Advantage, but the information will be posted on the website. Um, in Northern Minnesota, there's one scheduled for Brainerd at the Central Lakes College on February 25. That information is on our website. And uh, I believe Connie may have some more information about that. That's uh, Rural Sustainable Development Partnerships is hosting that meeting. So work is underway to get this plant material out to growers. And as that develops, we're trying to get the growers ready for it. So that might mean in your first year, just planting some seedlings to kind of learn your weed control systems, um, basically do a little bit of training. And then as the new material becomes available, you'll be ready. So with that, I'll, I'll stop here. Hopefully I haven't gone too far over and uh, might have a few, time, a few minutes here for questions. Yeah, we absolutely do have time, uh, about 10 minutes. So if anyone has any questions, please jump in. Um, you can see them on the chat and we'll answer them. Any questions from anybody? Oh, there's a question here, Jason, um, about Japanese beetles. Can you see that? Yeah, so um, Japanese beetles uh, will definitely feed on hazelnuts. It's not quite as bad as um, you know, some other plants like grapes, for example, but they, they will feed on them. What we've found is once the plants are mature, because the feeding is happening fairly late in the hazelnut production cycle, they've already set their buds for next year. The, they're not feeding on the actual hazelnut clusters, just the leaves. Is we have not seen any, um, any impact on the plants, even though they look pretty bad. Um, the exception would be, say, year one, year two, when they're just getting going it will be important to keep Japanese beetles off them. One advantage here, and we're learning that there are multiple advantages to growing hazelnuts in the northern parts of our states, is we don't, we don't have Japanese beetles in northern Wisconsin. They're, they're not this far north yet. Um, so that's you know, an opportunity perhaps for our northern growers that the southern growers don't have. Okay, I do see some more questions here. I, I can, Connie, yep. I can kind of scroll through these. Yep. So how many acres do you recommend having to begin? It's a good question. We have a, um, a publication that says, can I make money growing hazelnuts? And in there it talks about, you know, how many acres do you recommend? And really it's, as you'll learn with extension agents, you're never going to get a straight answer. You always get a, it depends. And the reality is it depends. So if you have to buy your own harvester, and pay for it, you're gonna need you know, more acres than if you're able to share a harvester with other growers. Um, what we're kind of recommending as you start out is about one acre. It's enough that it gives you nuts to work with. It's a big enough scale that you kind of have to learn how to do this beyond just being a gardener. Um, and so once you kind of do that first acre, then you can figure out how to scale up from there. Um, but again, you know, there's no single answer. It depends on a, a bunch of different variables. Um, are there soil and precip conditions that are more ideal? What we've found is hazelnuts are really widely adapted to sandy soils here in, in the far north, acidic soils to 
you know, growing on limestone bluffs and pH of seven and a half to eight, uh, all the way to a deep loamy soils. They definitely grow faster, the, the nicer the soil. So our planting south of Madison on the corn ground, you know, get, get really big. The plantings in Spooner on cold sand don't get quite as big. But here's the interesting thing is there might be this middle ground in our northern areas where we've got good nut production, but the plants don't get as big. And so they're easier to manage. And that kind of makes sense because hazelnuts are native to our northern more parts of the state. And the fact that our plant research plantings are doing well there, um, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. So really they're widely adapted. Um, there's really no soil type, you know, other than saturated wetland um, that we would say don't grow them at this point. In terms of fungicides, we are not really recommending or seeing any need for fungicides right now. If you're growing European hazelnut, you, you know, in Oregon, yeah, you've got to use fungicides on the susceptible stuff. But the plant, American hazelnut is resistant. The hybrids, not all of them are, but most of them are resistant. And so we're just not recommending any fungicide applications at this point. Um, what will a late frost do to the plants? So the catkins, the female flowers are resistant to frost, right? They bloom in, in depends on the year, but as early as March. Uh, and so they're really hardy. Once the catkins elongate and the pollen starts to shed, that pollen can freeze or the catkins can freeze. But again, they're adapted to our northern climates. And so in most years, we get good pollination. Uh, are there weed killers that can be sprayed over the plants that will only kill broadleaf weeds? We aren't recommending that you do that. Um, you know, there is some evidence that even something like Roundup at a low rate won't kill the plants or harm them, uh, but will kill the broadleaf weeds. But generally we would recommend that you use, uh, you know, if it's a broadleaf perennial weed that you kill those before you plant hazelnuts, like get the thistle out of the field before you plant hazelnuts. Uh, and then, you know, your broadleaves from th there would just be annuals that are sprouting from seeds every year and you can control those with a good heavy mulch layer. So we don't really see a need for herbicides except for, um, you know, spot applications to control thistles, scapes, or grass herbicides. Not grass. Uh, another question, is there any preventative measures that we need to take to help prevent any winter damage? Uh, for the American hazelnuts and hybrids, no. They are sufficiently winter hardy. The exception, and there's really not much you can control, is when we have really big snow events and you get, you know, heavy wet snow, um, and as it melts, it can start to snap off some branches, just like it does to any shrubs. So if you're thinking about, you know, um, like a living snow fence to try to keep drifting out of your hazelnuts and try to capture those drifts outside your hazelnut planting, that can help. I like the questions. Keep them coming. Uh, what fertilizers would you suggest for them? Uh, Lois Braun at University of Minnesota will be coming out with a publication shortly on fertility recommendations. At this point in the production years, uh, or sorry, in the establishment years, we're recommending a soil test and get your P and K to levels to that you would for say apple crop, right? It's really nothing too particular. The question in longer term is nitrogen fertilization and that's what Lois has been working on. And generally she's found is if, as long as you've got a decent soil, decent organic matter, you don't need nitrogen in the establishment years, but once you start harvesting nuts and taking nitrogen out of that plant, that adding some back uh, one way or another, whether it's organic fertilizers like uh, manure uh, or if it's um, you know chemical fertilizers like urea. But stay tuned for those that um, uh, research publication from from Lois, which will be on our website. Next question, I have sandy loam. How will that work? It will work fantastically well. That might be the ideal soil for hazelnuts. So go for it. How about heavy clay? Not quite so ideal, but that's where I live on heavy clay. And the plants, as long as you do some decent site preparation, get some organic matter worked in so that the plants can get established, they actually do quite well. Uh, they maybe don't grow as fast as they will on a sandy loam, but with that extra um, clay and the soil moisture in the, in the clay, you know, there's just less watering in the early years and uh, you can get good production. So definitely heavy clay is an option. Next question, I have three American hazelnuts, two have smaller and harder filberts, one with double its size. Can I amend the two to increase its size or is it not possible? First of all, we don't use the word filberts anymore. <laughs> we use hazelnuts, right? <laughs> filberts just sounds like a bad word. Anyway, um, 
if you've got a plant that does not produce very large nuts, you can add all the fertilizer in the will, world and you're really not going to make those nuts any bigger. Um, you might get more of them. You might get bigger clusters with more nuts in them, but the size is kind of genetically controlled. So um, if you're trying to, to grow larger nuts, you need a plant that produces larger nuts. Uh, I planted some first cross last spring from Forest Ag, Wisconsin. When should they start producing? If they were the bare dormant plants and they established well in the spring, you should start seeing nuts in the third year. So year one, you plant, year two, they grow, year three, you might see a few nuts if all goes well. But generally not till year four do you see decent production and it's by year five, year six that you're in full production. How do I sign up for the Brainerd class? Uh, that's a question for you, Connie. Oh uh, yeah, we have some registration uh, materials for that um, and I can probably track down a link or why don't you just send me your contact information. Um, I put my email in the chat. It's carl5114 at umn.edu and I can send you uh, materials on getting registered for that. Great. Next question. Can you graph from one plant to another? Yes, you can. Um, it's not quite your success rate isn't as high as it would be say for apples, but it's definitely doable. The challenge you've got though is because you're grafting onto a, a shrubby plant, right? The rootstock is gonna keep sending up suckers and suckers and suckers and eventually it'll overtake your grafted stem. So if you can you know, keep the suckers down and manage it as a single stem or multiple stems if you graft it that way, it definitely can work. Some people have grafted onto Turkish rootstock, which tends to be much more of a tree. It doesn't sucker as much, so you could try that. How do I get the Rose 9-2 plants? Yeah, that's a great question. They're in propagation. They're not available yet. A um, couple of things is stay, uh, stay tuned to that website. You know, check it fairly often. You can sign up for our mailing list on that website and we send out updates as we get them for when the plants are available. I also recommend if you can join a grower network because those grower networks may even end up with some priority to get this plant material. So you definitely wanna stay involved that way. Uh, can I replace the American hazelnuts with one of the hybrids you've suggested? And yes, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but yeah, you can definitely grow hybrids wherever you can grow American hazelnuts. Uh, and then the next one was question looks like for you, Connie. I do not see your email address. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll try to pull up that chat and put it in there. Um, not, oh, there we go. So for everyone, here we go. Carl5114 at umn.edu. There you go. Hopefully you see it now. All right, any last minute questions here? Great, well it is 7.01. So thank you very much, Jason, for um, your wealth of information. I've been working with you on this for a few years now and every time I listen to this, I just, I learn more and I get more excited about hazelnuts, which it's pretty crazy because I'm pretty excited about hazelnuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so to everyone who's still on online here, please fill out the uh, evaluation that we will be sending you. Um, we really want to hear from you. Please share this uh, information, share your experience across your social media channels, especially if you really enjoyed the experience. And please uh, consider joining us next week. We have Sarah Lindblom coming, and she is going to be talking about soil testing, especially for small uh, for veg, fruit and veggie production, soil health and fruit and veggie production. And it explores the five soil health principles, and she's been doing this presentation across the state, so she's a great uh, presenter. And lastly, if you are interested in looking at our archives, we have this website set up for you to uh, explore what we've talked about in the past. We have garlic and wool and eating bugs and all sorts of different uh, topics. So it's a, it's a great time and we hope you join us. And thank you very much for joining us tonight.